welcome everybody today here to, as I mentioned, the very first BuzzJS. Uh, my name is Daniel Zen, and I have the pleasure of giving the first talk today. We have a lot of great talks for you today, uh, all on the subject of JavaScript. And as a consequence of me going first, I'm going to try and give a little bit of an overview of what you're going to have today, and give a little bit of the state of the union of JavaScript, which has been and has seen a lot of changes in the last several years. In fact, uh, I often say that if you took someone in a time machine just two years in the past and made them travel right to today, the last two years of JavaScript have been astounding. And I think that most, most people, they would go, wait, what happened? And um, so let's go over what, what we have today with JavaScript and tomorrow. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is uh, Daniel Zen. Uh, I'm a systems architect and the CEO of Zen Digital. Uh, I have an agile engineering background, which when I was doing it was called extreme programming. Um, I started the Angular JS NYC meetup in mid middle of 2012, uh, and that was, I guess, about six months after I started using Angular, and just a few short months after. Angular had made it finally to its 1.0 release date. Uh, I formed Zen Digital in 2014 uh, and leveraged the JavaScript community that existed at the time. I had come from a Java background in extreme programming and was moving towards Ruby when JavaScript sort of took my fancy. I said, wow, this, this thing is really taking off. And, and it had been, I think, for a while at that time. But there were a few, there was a, a few things that were converging to make uh, JavaScript at the time really, you know, hot, if you will. Let's see. So uh, Zen Digital is basically based on user experiences for web and mobile. Uh, we have scalable microservices-based APIs that we create. We mandate best practices for development and deployment. We do a lot of corporate training, and I speak at a lot of conferences like, like this one. And we do full stack JavaScript, which like Stacey was saying, and JavaScript is really one of the only languages that that can be said about, in my opinion, to say it's a full stack language. So just a little overview of what I'm gonna do today. I'm gonna try to avoid giving a huge history of JavaScript. I think it's been done so many times, and JavaScript's old enough now that it's kind of like going to one of those superhero movies where they, they do a remake, and then you're watching the whole origin story all over again. So I'm going to do, do my best to avoid that. Of course, there might be a few references here and there. Um, hold on, I'm just fixing my screen here. So I'm going to go over what makes JavaScript different from other languages and talk about the present and the future, as I've mentioned. Preview of what we're going to see today in the other talks and then more in-depth look at what is needed to be a modern JavaScript developer. So what makes JavaScript different? Uh, if you're coming from any other programming language, one of the first things might be, well, it's an interpreted language. Most, most other languages you've probably dealt with are compiled. But modern day JavaScript is now also transpiled. So it's a bit of a split personality there. Um, it's single-threaded because it's, you know, it's got the callback system that most of you are hopefully familiar with if you're JavaScript developers. Nowadays, we're doing it with promises. Reactive programming is definitely in vogue and sort of taking over for promises. And we're going to see new asynchronous features coming down the pipeline in ES7. But at the same time, if you have web workers, you sort of have a separate thread. And if you're using a Node.js microservice architecture, you might have multiple threads of your server-side system. So it's single-threaded, and wait a second, it can also sort of be in your architecture multi-threaded. Uh, it's a functional language. It's got first-class functions. You can treat functions as variables. It uh, has lambda calculus capabilities. It's got closures, lambda expressions, which are made a lot easier with the arrow functions that are now available in ES6. We also have tail call optimization or recursion. Um, but it's also an object-oriented language. So even though we've got a functional language, we can treat it like an object-oriented language. Now we've got the new class 
features. We can also, it's, it's just syntactic sugar on top of the old prototypical class, uh, prototypical object architecture. But essentially, for those people coming from other programming languages, they can start to treat it like an object-oriented language. So what does that essentially mean? It's not only a floor wax, it's also a dessert topping. So where is JavaScript today? It's in every single desktop web browser. It's in every one of our smartphones. With Node.js, we have it at the command line. It's now available on every web server, maybe not installed in every web server, but at least available, something that you can install. It's now available for desktop applications. We have Electron now, which started with Atom uh, from GitHub. They released their code editor, and it featured a full Chromium browser kind of dressed up as an application. It had Node.js and web workers all in one. And I have personally, personally used Atom. Uh, I don't know how it's pronounced, if it's kitomatic or kitomatic, but if you're a Docker user and you're on the Mac OS or Windows nowadays, you, you, you're familiar with it. Um, Visual Studio Code from Microsoft and Ionic Lab, all are actually Electron applications. So you can actually create your desktop applications using JavaScript and CSS and HTML, uh, as well as your mobile applications and your web applications. JavaScript's available for mobile. We have mobile hybrid. I'm a particular fan of Ionic. I've actually done a few talks on how to create Ionic apps in a very short amount of time. Uh, and you can do a uh, search on YouTube for those if you're interested. And that's done via Cordova, which sort of gives you an HTML and JavaScript layer in your mobile browser. There's also Sencha and uh, Xamarin that are available for you to do uh, mobile applications using JavaScript. And nowadays, we're creating native applications using JavaScript. We have native script, which uses the Angular system. We have React Native, which uses the React system to create native applications using JavaScript. And what about tomorrow? Where are we going to see JavaScript tomorrow? Uh, embedded systems, microcontrollers, the Internet of Things, uh, here's a list of several projects that are all taking JavaScript into the microcontroller and Internet of Things. Um, and, and this is actually, and there's some others that exist that have actually fallen to the wayside. But these are the ones that are still in active development. And you, you can, and I remember I was actually here in this very room and I saw a microcontroller presentation uh, using JavaScript uh, a few months back. So, let me try and cover everything you wanted to know about JavaScript. Uh, let's talk about React and Flux and Angular and Aurelia. We've got Ember and Meteor, MongoDB. We're gonna talk about testing with Mocha and Jasmine and Babel. We've got TypeScript, of course. Uh, Flow and Node.js can't be forgotten. You know, we talk about the V8 engine and everything. So, so um, I think we're gonna need a bigger boat. Bottom line is, I'm not gonna be able to cover everything in this short little talk, but fortunately we have six other talks after me that are going to discuss various areas of JavaScript. So I'm gonna do my best to give a high level overview of what's going on. So where is JavaScript today? So most of you, if you're a JavaScript developer, for any length of time whatsoever, you're familiar with ECMAScript 5, or ES5, as I'll call it, because it's shorter and rolls off the tongue. That's what I call good old JavaScript, at least these days. But last year, in the middle of last year, ECMAScript 2015, or ES6, as I will call it, because that also rolls off the tongue a little easier, that's really today's JavaScript. And that's, that's where anybody who's programming in JavaScript should be aiming for, at a minimum. We've got uh, module loading and dependency management that's now been added into the language. We have promises as first class citizens, not just as libraries that have been tacked on. Uh, we have classes, as I mentioned earlier, and arrow functions, which really make for more concise code. It allows us to not worry about uh, binding to our 
uh, this variable when we're calling certain subroutines because uh, arrow functions don't have a this context. Uh, we have generators which allow us to pause in the middle one or many times and resume later our functions using yield. Uh, we have template strings. We finally have uh, proper uh, scoping with our variables with the let keyword. We have constants that we can define and will actually be obeyed inside of our, as opposed to just being an alias for var. Um, we have reflection APIs, uh, tail calls as I mentioned. And of course, you could insert your favorite new syntactical feature because there is a ton of syntactic sugar that has been added to make JavaScript a much more concise language as opposed to overly verbose as it has started to become with ES5. Uh, in fact, it was so overly verbose that it started to spawn uh, other languages like CoffeeScript, which were created partly to satisfy the Ruby crowd who wanted something that looked a little bit more like the language they were familiar with, and partly because they wanted something more concise. So finally, JavaScript, by default, can be written in a much more concise manner. And tomorrow, we have new features, um, ES7 and beyond, or ES next. And there's a compatibility table on Kangex, and I, I have a link when we give out the slides later. Uh, and you can see some of the things that we're already using today. If you're an Angular developer, you're already potentially using decorators, which are not part and proper of ES6, but are available as an extension. We have the React, uh, reactive JS extensions, which are also being used extensively in AngularJS. TypeScript, which is not officially JavaScript, but is a superset, which allows us to have our strong typing. And coming down in the next version of, of JavaScript, we see exponentation, uh, exponentation uh, mm -hmm. operators. We've got uh, array prototype includes, which is, these are kind of minor changes. The truth is that we're going to see a lot more small changes to JavaScript in the future as opposed to seeing the massive changes we just saw with ES6. Instead, they'll be much more incremental and smaller. Because JavaScript was kind of in a holding pattern for a really long time. I don't know if anybody's familiar with what happened with ES4, but basically it kind of got thrown away. There was a time at which there was arguments about what direction JavaScript should go in, and the standards bodies were slow to actually choose a direction. And as a consequence, we stalled. JavaScript stalled for a really long time, and it's finally back on track. And so we're going to see, once again, incremental changes that add smaller changes to the language instead of seeing the big, massive ones that have happened in the past. Uh, and finally, I think uh, a sync, uh, uh, async and, and await uh, functionality, which will allow us to deal with asynchronous functions much better. Uh, and then insert your favorite feature that's coming you know, at the bottom here. So, as I mentioned, I'm going, to I'm going to just go over quickly what we're going to see today. So I'm going to talk very briefly on, on front-end frameworks because I'm trying to cover everything. But Gleb will be going into much greater detail and talking about which ones should you learn. Of course, you should just spend some time and learn all of them, right? If only we all had that much time. Um, what are the common features of the various front-end frameworks that we're seeing today? Uh, how do they differ? differ? Which ones are better? How, how do I choose? What's popular? Is that, is that the way I choose? What can we do to future-proof the work that we create today? Uh, a lot of people are wondering, they've created Angular 1 applications, and everybody is trying to figure out, how do I now migrate to Angular 2, or do I need to? Is that a requirement, or can I migrate my logic to another framework? What do I need to do to, to stay current? at the end. <laughs> um, we're going to see reactive streams uh, and, and virtual DOMs, and he's going to cover all of that. Sandro Pasquale is going to be talking about JSON schemas, which technically don't only, aren't only used in JavaScript. JSON can be used in any language these days, but JSON does stand for JavaScript object notation. So he's going to talk about how to use JSON with JavaScript to create smarter APIs, uh, specifying their, their payload. Sorry. Uh, 
the ability to query APIs for their schemas and actually get that information back from an API and say, hey, what, what is the proper way to talk to this API? Uh, potentially auto-generate the user interfaces for your UIs because once you know the schema, you can create a user interface based on that schema. Might not be exactly what you want, but you can start to see what you know, Ruby on Rails had when they would quickly generate a UI. Now we're gonna be able to do that uh, with JavaScript. Uh, we're gonna be able to build automated testing harnesses based on JSON schemas. And they, of course, as I mentioned, are parsable in multiple languages, not just JavaScript. Uh, Andreas is going to be showing us end-to-end -end testing using uh, Protractor. Uh, he's going to specifically be focusing on Angular 1 and 2, but Protractor these days, which is based on Selenium, uh, can be used for testing frameworks uh, to create testing frameworks for other uh, frame, um, testing harnesses for other frameworks as well. We're going to see how to create automated, repeatable tests in the browser as though they were being done by a user. And after lunch, Alex Castillo will wow us with an open source brain computer <laughs> interface that actually uses uh, outputs of, from, uh, in, with JavaScript to visualize brainwaves in a browser using Angular. And we'll find out if the next wearable is actually going to be a hat. <laughs> We're going to have an introduction to React Native by Stan, who will cover the foundations of the framework uh, using JavaScript to build native mobile, which I discussed you know, briefly as one of the options in creating native application, uh, mobile native applications, both for iOS and Android, and he's gonna talk about the best practices for the cross-platform mobile development using React Native. Ari Lerner will finish us off with a uh, introduction to Angular 2 something that I've already been training people in and I've been using extensively. Uh, we're gonna show how to build your first Angular 2 app. We're gonna create components and services and routing. We're gonna organize your application and prepare it for production. So, I, I don't ask this question too much, but if you wanna know why JavaScript is the future, I think the simple answer is, it's the language of the web. And as we all know, the web is the language of the world. It's everywhere now. It's, you know, I think the expression is JavaScript is eating the world. And with the V8 engine that came out, I think it was 2008, that beget Node. And once we had Node, things really started to take off. In fact, I think once we had the V8 engine, things really started to take off, to be realistic. And I'm gonna talk at the end if there are any alternatives. Is there anything else that might actually replace JavaScript? And there are, there's one potential contender, but the truth is I, I don't think we're gonna see anything replace it for a very long time. And we're on a huge growth ramp right now. So even if something in the long term was able to replace it, it's going to be huge if it isn't already, which it kind of is. Um, we have transpilers which allow us to program in other languages and then turn that into JavaScript. Um, so for instance, if you love Ruby, you've got CoffeeScript, which has a very similar syntax. Or Dart, if you love Lars Bach, who's created the V8 JavaScript engine, as well as the Hotspot engine in the Java Virtual Machine. Um, if we've got Babel, if you love the ES standards, ECMAScript standards, which I think you should, I think we all should, really, Standards is, is a great place to start. And of course, if you want to move beyond standards, we have TypeScript, if you long strong typed object oriented programming, which as a, coming from a Java background, that's something I do love. So, uh, and I also love the refactoring tools that having strong typing allow when you're doing development, something that you can't do with plain old JavaScript as easily, refactoring. So I believe one of the most important things in JavaScript come, that's currently happening and in the future is the module system. So at the moment, we have a lot of different 
competing module systems, if you will. We have um, the asynchronous module system from Acquire.js. We have Common.js, which Node took part of, or at least a version of. We, and and we, more, most importantly, we have the new ES6 module syntax with the import command, as well as, of course, the old ES5 global system, which I don't think anybody should love. You know, I, I've often said when teaching JavaScript that globals are evil, and unfortunately, JavaScript was really all about globals for a very long time. We're finally at the point where we can rid ourselves of globals in the language, that we have a means of actually having local thread safe storage. And there are different loading mechanisms for each of these systems. We have Require.js, we have old school Browserify, we, and now we have the two latest contenders, Webpack and my personal favorite, System.js. And the reason why I like System.js the best is really it is the most standards based. It is the one that embraces the future of JavaScript with imports. You know, and speaking of uh, modules and, and packages, you know, one of the great reasons that Node.js has been so successful is because of NPM. If it wasn't for the rich package management system that Node has, it would be nowhere near as popular as it is today. So modules and packaging them up is extremely important, and this is probably one of the most important things for the future of JavaScript. That being said, let's talk more about modules, modules and modules. So currently, we don't have any native support for ES6 modules. It's not available in the browser. It's not available in Node. So we have to use a transpilation tool, either Babel or TypeScript, to support it. Or we have to use a tool that uses a transpiler, such as Webpack or System.js. It's really the only way we're going to be able to, to use this new system which is kind of strange. You, you, if you actually looked at the Can I Use website that asks that, that kind of tells you which features are available in the latest browsers, you would find that we're approaching 90%, if not 95% completion of the ES6 standards inside of the browsers. And Node.js with version five, if not six, has really started to show that ES6 is, you know, is the norm. So another reason why if you're programming in ES5, stop now and embrace ES6. But the one thing we're still missing is this import statement in modules, and that's, that's a huge deal. Um, so we finally have the possibility of a single standard, but you know, that, that, that's the problem. Everybody's like, okay, we need a standard to fix all this, so instead of having, we, we add yet another standard. And in fact, uh, I'll talk a little bit later about uh, the JS package manager, JSPM, which sort of is, uh, an overarching umbrella of all the current standards and sort of creates yet another standard that we can use. And more modules. Common opinion uh, out on the web I find is that Bower is dead. But I actually got in trouble for saying that when I was teaching a class recently because it was a corporate class and they were like, hey, we're still using Bower. You can't say that. You know, so, that, so obviously it's not completely dead. There's always going to be le legacy code out there. But if you were starting from scratch right now, Bower's probably not the way to go. Um, NPM is not going anywhere anytime soon. So if you had to choose a package man management system, NPM is definitely a good bet. And as I mentioned, uh, System.js with JSPM, they're forward thinking. They're the ones that are they're embracing uh, the future standards and backwards compatibility towards all of the old package systems. So System.js supports every module format that's currently available, and I believe you can even extend JSPM to support Bower if that's your desire, so it's possible. Um, JSPM natively supports NPM, GitHub. Uh, I don't think it natively supports Bower, once again, through extensions. And so some people say, hey, do we really need another package management system? Doesn't NPM really take care of it all for us? Um, but its support for the ES6 module syntax is ideal. And Webpack is still a viable option today and, uh, and will be for a while to come, and especially for development, because it has some extra features at the development stage, not necessarily for the deployment stage, that really make uh, Webpack pretty cool. But it's sort of like a developer feature packed onto a package management system. You know, you could always just create a better development um, 
iterative flow and add that on to, JS, uh, to system JS as well. I mean, that, that's really the big, big advantage of Webpack today is at the development stage. So transpilers are definitely here to stay. We are living in a post ES5 world. The build step is already in place. I personally am using Gulp. A lot of people are using the NPM run scripts. So there's, there's a build step at some point. And once you have a build step in place, it's really easy to add transpilation as one of the steps in your build. So popular frameworks require it. Angular 2, okay, maybe you could kind of, I've, I've done it. You can code Angular 2 in ES5. It's possible. It's really ugly. I can't even tell you. It's like really trying to put a, a square peg in a round hole. Um, but it's possible. So I'm going to say it requires it. Uh, the native module syntax requires it. If you want to use those import statements, you really have to use some form of transpilation. Uh, and it's not clear how long it's going to take until that's no longer true. Uh, some people think it's, gonna, it's not going to happen by the end of this year. I don't know how it, you know, don't hold your breath is the bottom line. You're going to need transpilation for a while to come. And the popular options are Babel and TypeScript. You know, there's also Tracer and a few others. But, but typically, the, these steps, either Babel or, or TypeScript, are going to be in your JavaScript build. And nowadays, JavaScript has class even if it didn't really need it. Um, but this is going to attract the object-oriented programming crowd, like me. I was a Java developer, and I remember like sort of, oh, I can't wait until JavaScript has a class keyword. It was something I really wanted. I think I remember um, ActionScript had the class keyword, and Ac ActionScript being an ECMAScript version. So I was really you know, thinking that it was going to happen a lot sooner than it did. And, and I really like it now that it has it, because I still know how to program as an object-oriented programmer, because that's been around for a long time. But the truth is, there's a lot of people that are taking advantage of the fact that JavaScript is a functional programming language. They aren't using objects at all. In fact, uh, I read or saw an interview recently with Douglas Crockford, who really was the guy who came out and said, here's how to do object-oriented JavaScript. And he basically said he's not using object-oriented JavaScript at all anymore, and that he's doing everything as a functional program. So that's kind of where that, that you know, dessert topping and floor wax kind of comes from. You, have, you can choose. And a lot of these old object-oriented programming languages, they're adding on functional programming capabilities. Whoops. They're, they're adding on functional programming capabilities, where JavaScript's sort of coming from, you know, J JavaScript has always been a functional programming language. And if you knew how to use it, which most people for the first five, six years did not, it was always an object-oriented programming language. I remember for the first few years, I would say, this is where I guess I talk about the past a little bit. I, uh, I, I would say, oh, it's an object-based language. I was a little bit afraid to call it object-oriented because I was a Java developer. And to me, JavaScript wasn't object-oriented. And then Douglas Crockford kind of came along and said, well, wait a second. If you do this, this, and this, you can totally treat it like an object-oriented language. And I remember try, trying to do that and not quite knowing how. And then when he kind of you know, JavaScript has been done by convention for so long. It's not like it was built into the language, but people learned all the techniques to sort of eke out greater functionality from JavaScript. And then once those techniques were made available, either people rendered them in syntax because we have uh, polyfills and the like, or they just learned that uh, convention and they learned, hey, you know, this is how you do an iffy, this is how you do a this, this is how you do that. And there's all these conventions sort of got added to the vocabulary of how to program JavaScript. But now, with class as a real keyword in the language, we can just treat it like an object-oriented language. And in TypeScript, we actually have the ability to implement interfaces on top of classes, because you sort of need type to, impl to, to have implemented interfaces. And TypeScript gives us that. So that starts to look a lot more like Java, or C Sharp and some of the others. So, Let's take a quick look, and this is probably my only code example here, because I didn't want to be a heavy code talker. You're going to have plenty of that going on later. So here's ES5. We see the old school way to kind of create a, a class, but instead of calling it a class, I call it a person type. And here we, uh, person type has a name, 
and we can define inside of the prototype same name so that every person type will have access to the same name variable, and the same name variable accesses its name, this dot name. And so we can create a new person type named Nicholas. We can ask that person to say his name, and Nicholas will be output because of the console log. And if we ask what is the instance of person type, we find out that it is uh, a person, you know, it's person type and uh, it's an object. So we see that it's kind of following, it looks logical. And so now in ES6, we have syntactic sugar, and I, to make it fit on the slide, I put the, the constructor and same name on a single line. So now we can say class, person class which is the way we used to, I used to do it in Java, if any of you have a Java background or another object-oriented programming language background. And we have a constructor that takes a name and we once again set this dot name to the incoming name. And we have say name, which does the console log. But this starts to look a lot more like a standard object-oriented programming language. We no longer need to deal with the prototype directly. And we can say, let the person equal a new person class. Notice we're using let because we're in ES6 now and we can ask the person to say their name and it outputs Nicholas and it looks, looks like object-oriented programming to me. Um, we can see that person is an instance of person class and person is an instance of object. There's only one problem is that if you look under the hood a little bit deeper, we find out that the type of person class is still essentially a function. So in other words, this was all syntactic sugar. It's really doing the exact same thing as in ES5. It's just giving us keywords to make it easier and look and friendlier to our object-oriented programming friends. But that's great. That's going to attract all those people to, to JavaScript. And it allows people who want to program JavaScript as an object-oriented programming language, it allows them to do it. So let's talk about libraries and frameworks. Uh, on GitHub, JavaScript has the most active repositories. It has the most total pushes, and it has the most projects. That's insane, right? That pretty much means JavaScript is the language. On Stack Overflow, JavaScript has the most tags. I mean, JavaScript is everywhere, and everyone is moving or using it in some way, shape, or form. Almost all of the JavaScript libraries are open source. I mean, 99%, I'd love an actual number, but it's kind of, kind of crazy that here's a language and almost all the code that's out there is open source. Um, the, the model now is to offer support, and as a consequence, it's very difficult to choose a framework because all of the frameworks are available for you to like, sort through and look through them. They're all just out there in the open. So any, any talk about JavaScript would be incomplete without mentioning jQuery. No matter how you, you slice it, jQuery is still the reigning champ when it comes to popularity. It is the most popular, it's the most widely used library in JavaScript. However, the new frameworks that are coming out try to dissuade you from using jQuery. They, they start to move towards a declarative style instead of the imperative style that jQuery sort of espouses. Uh, so for instance, React and Angular 2, although you can use jQuery, they don't really want you to and they recommend that you don't. And so, but no matter what anybody says, and some people are saying, oh, jQuery is dying, that is not what the trends say. The trends still say that jQuery is on the rise. That being said, I am not using it. But, but it's still really growing, so. If you're, if you're one of those people that still loves jQuery, you're not in a minority. That's all I'm going to say. I think no conversation would be complete without talking about React. React has just gone crazy in the last year and a half. Uh, it got popular really fast, partly because it was simple and it itself was really fast. It deals really well with component rendering. It has the virtual DOM, it has data binding, and it's trusted because it's used by really large corporations that we assume know what they're talking about. So when you find out that Facebook and Instagram and Netflix and all these other companies are using React, it makes it a lot easier for you to choose it as your framework of choice. However, React is criticized in some circles because it violates the separation of concerns. 
it mixes JavaScript and HTML in a way I was always taught not to do. You're supposed to have your logic in one place, and you're supposed to have your rendering in another, and you're really not supposed to put them in the same place, and React has a tendency to do that. And it's also not a full application stack. It's mostly based on component rendering, so you have to deal with pulling in all these other libraries. And as a, co and as a consequence of that, people will use React in all sorts of different situations with all sorts of different other libraries. So if you walk into a project that's using React, it might look completely different to another pro project that's using React. And of course, since I, I help run the Angular meetup, I can't, can't have this talk go on without talking about AngularJS. Immensely popular. Steep learning curve, but it's kind of like snowboarding. You spend a few days on the slopes, and then suddenly it starts to seem really easy. So it, it might be hard at first, but it's really worth sticking with, and I recommend it highly. Uh, the documentation was kind of poor. In fact, I helped write a little bit of it early on. And uh, the developer ecosystem got huge really fast. So there's lots of opportunities out there to ask questions and, and get answers. There's so many questions about Angular on Stack Overflow. And Angular 2 is poised for tremendous growth. It's leveraging the popularity and the pattern of Angular JS 1. And some say it's easier, despite the addition of all of the new features of ES6 and TypeScript and Reactive. It's, some people still say it's an easier, uh, easier to use. And I'm just going to quickly go over some other frameworks and to mention that Backbone is on the decline. Aurelia, created by Rob Eisenberg, who both joined and left the Angular 2 team, has his own framework that has some similarities. Um, Ember, which still has a, a very nice niche. Uh, Meteor, with its isomorphic capabilities, allowing you to run the exact same code on the server and on the client. And web components, the standard that just won't happen. I was so looking forward to web components, but I can't find them in anywhere except for Chrome. And although there are polyfills, that doesn't seem to fill the needs. And so web components is sort of slow to evolve. And I, I have to mention testing because I have an extreme background. So I'm just going to quickly talk about Jasmine and Mocha and Chai and Karma for a test running. And I already mentioned that we're going to have a talk on Protractor later. So, so I mentioned I was going to talk about what are the competitors to the JavaScript throne. So there is ASM.js, which is actually still JavaScript. It's just a subset of JavaScript, but it has the ability to um, transpile other languages, completely different languages like C or C++, into a subset of JavaScript that could potentially be run in the web. And I've heard it said that JavaScript is the assembly language of the web, and this is, is an attempt to sort of prove that. But the next step would be to actually create a portable binary format to serve as a compilation target and put that in every browser. And that's what WebAssembly is trying to do, and that's not JavaScript. But it's meant to be uh, executed in the same semantic universe as JavaScript and support calls to and from JavaScript. And this is the only thing that I see in the future that has any potential to replace JavaScript. And it still works inside of the JavaScript universe. Because if people can take all of their different programming languages and then just compile them to run inside of a browser in an assembly-based format, that could take off. You know, and I'm, you're, and you're, you know, that's still in the works. You're not going to see that happen in the next year or two. We're talking like five years out, this might start to become really big. So with that, I'm going to open the floor to questions. I thank you very much for, for your attention. And if you have any questions, we have about five minutes before um, a short break for the next speakers. Yes? Yeah. Um, you mentioned Electron. It seems like it uh, has an awful lot of you know, I, I almost had somebody speak on Electron today. We had a lot of talk. We had a lot of talk proposals that were given in, and unfortunately, the person that was going to talk on Electron could not, could, couldn't make it, um, which is a shame because I think it's tremendously powerful to have JavaScript on the desktop and a cross-platform desktop at that. Um, I mean, it basically takes the best of every JavaScript world. You've got the Chromium browser so that you have the best of your front end, if you will. You have web workers so that you can have front end web workers 
and you also have Node.js. So you have everything sort of available to you to write JavaScript. Now, I can't say I'm, I'm an expert at the architecture inside of Electron itself. I understand Node.js you know, architecture really well, and I understand front-end architecture very well. But once you start to put all of them together, that's like a new, unique space. But in that space, you have options and opportunity. Is there any specific question you want you want to answer? Because well, you know what, I think my level is a little bit below yours, and so I'm sorry that guy couldn't make the talk. Also, me too. Please keep it in mind. I will do. I mean, and, and the truth is, once if you were creating a brand new desktop application today, and you, I mean, and your skill set is a, as a as a web developer. I, I can't imagine trying to choose another framework if not for Electron. It's the only one really available today. I think there's an NSJS or that's out there as well, but I'm not even going to cover that. Yes? Did you say that uh, Webpack is at least potentially compatible with JSVI? Um, I, I didn't explicitly say that, but now I'm trying to think of what, what you could do with Webpack. No, it's, it's sort of one of the things that Webpack does not support JSPM. It supports NPM, I believe, uh, by default. So I, I don't think off, off the top of my head, I don't believe so. Yeah, it's, you know, JSPM is really meant for system JS, per se. Oh, uh, my question is for JSPM, does that prevent conflicting versions of the same dependency? Oh yeah, it's got every, it's got every conflict detection, it's got cyclical conflict detection, and it has the ability to have multiple versions of the same library for different portions of your code. So okay, if one if portion- I don't want that, I can turn that off. You, okay. you, you can configure it very, well, and that's the, the, the system.js config file allows you to set everything. It's a, you know, and that's kind of annoying when you're first getting started with system.js, and if any of you have been using Angular, you might have already had to deal with this. But you sort of have to go in and sort of tell it, hey, this library is available here, and the main code to run is named this. And you have to do a lot of, like, fiddling to get the set the setup. But once you have the setup, you have a tremendous power to select which which libraries you want in which location. So you can actually have multiple versions of the same library if you want. Okay. Yes. Sure. Well, I, I mean, I, ha I have not used React Native uh, or NativeScript as much as I've used Ionic specifically. So, and I actually, even before Ionic, I was trying to put Angular inside of Cordova before Ionic was launched. So I have a lot more experience with that. And I will say that there, there were a lot of tricks early on. I mean, things have changed over time, but there were a lot of things, um, a lot of slowness, if you will, in the original implementations inside. You had to deal with the fact that the bottom line is the mobile browsers have not been given enough attention. That the desktop browsers have all been optimized, and in particular, Apple with iOS has sort of got a stranglehold on making sure that um, you know the iOS web browser is not as fast as everything else. And, and I hate to say it, but there is some politics there. iOS makes money from selling apps in the App Store. If you could create web-based apps, and the truth is, with something like Ionic or Cordova, you could, you're putting it potentially in, in the store as well, but I think they're discouraging use of getting away from their library space, you know? When, when somebody uses your libraries, you kind of own their, their brain space. They're thinking about your libraries. If people start moving to another library space, then you're sort of losing them. So, in fact, it becomes a lot easier to write an application that then gets, uh, you know, ported to Android and maybe Android becomes your main, main target. So, um, I think native script sort of solves some of that problem to a certain extent because now you're writing potentially cross-platform code that's calling native applications. You have all the speed capabilities of the native platform. Um, but you also have, some, you know, other issues that, and I'm sure our second to last talk today will be on a React Native, so we'll get some of that coming out. I'm actually looking forward to that talk myself. Yes? Uh, can you make some comments about IDEs? Okay, yeah, that's easy to do. So, I mean, the two, the two, the two reigning champs at the moment, I think, is WebStorm, which, or for JavaScript in particular, and uh, Visual Studio Code uh, for TypeScript. And, but you can actually use WebStorm for TypeScript. Well, I think th those are the two that are really, that are the winners. I mean, sure, you can tell me you're using Sublime or Atom or 
you know, something else in that sort of category, but they won't have all the feature set to be able to manipulate JavaScript. And in particular, WebStorm has the refactoring tools, which I think turn your code into clay. It's really important to be able to take a subroutine and extract it out and say, oh, this code here, that's actually a subroutine, and or you know, this, this, I need to insert this and reshape your code. And using WebStorm, it has that capability, and I've been told that Visual uh, Studio Code is adding that to the next version. So those are the two features I think are most important, and although Visual Studio Code doesn't have it yet, and it's, it's going to, I think anywhere else you're, 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 just, you're just saying, hey, I don't need those features. I don't need an IDE that supports all this functionality. That's why you need the transpilation. What's that? Where do you draw the line? Like, do I go to this, you know, nicer syntax, then lose support from old browsers? I think, I mean, I tried to say it. I basically think that ES6 is what you, is where you have to be. If you want to be a modern JavaScript developer, you have to add transpilation to your process. You know, I, I'm sorry, it's just where we are today. And it's, and not only that, I don't think it's going away anytime soon that we're gonna be stuck with transpilation for a while because the module loading systems are not going to be available natively for a while. So we're gonna see at least, I think, a three year period or two, a two to three year period where transpilation is the norm. And once we have it, you know, it might be hard to get rid of. People will get used to it. You know, I, maybe there'll be some custom browsers that have sort of built in native engines, but it seems like the standard web browsers that typical people out there are using won't. And if you, know, if you had one web browser that did it right, you could just do all your development in it and skip the transpilation stage for development and then just transpile for delivery. And that, that would work. So you need just one really good standards-based browser with built-in module loading and ES6 and then you'd have what you need for development. But no, I'm sorry, transpilation is here to stay for a while. Um, <coughs> I think, I think that's it for now. I think we should take a, oh, one more question. Sorry. Uh, what I understand is like uh, using TypeScript, we can learn some ES6 features that's out there, right? So do you think like once ES6 is released, would TypeScript get obsolete or we, this race condition always happens where like TypeScript or Babel or whatever, just keep a little ahead of ES7 features will be loaned now. That thing will happen so we can just stick with this trans, whatever that, that thing so that we are ahead of this ES, that there is a slowness that they, the body takes some time, what do you see that? Okay, well I, I think there's, first, let me start with the first statement, which is ES6 is released. It has been released for almost a year now, which is the funny thing, but it, you know, it's released as a specification, and it just takes a while to make it into the browsers. So my question is, when you say released, do you mean in the browsers? And even then, most of ES6, like I said, 90 to 95% of it is actually now in the browsers, except for the module loading system. And until you get the module loading system, you need to continue to use transpilation, and that's why we're stuck with it. Um, as for TypeScript, you're really making a, a decision of, hey, once you go to TypeScript, it's really hard to go back, partly because you'd have to strip, I mean, I'm sure you could get a tool that could strip out your types and still make it run, but uh, you also lose the transpilation step of checking your types, which is, you know, some people like. And, and uh, you don't need to move to TypeScript, although, shh, don't tell Microsoft that. You don't, I mean, you know, <laughs> ba Babel, is, Babel is available for ES6, and, and the funny thing about Babel is it has an extendable architecture as well. So you can say, hey, I want to add decorators in, and that's what Angular is doing. They add decorators into Babel, and so decorators become part of their syntax, even though it's not part of the ES6 standard. So with that, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your attention, and... Uh,